You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and I'm joined today by none other than the Gritty Broman. How are you, Brent? I'm well. Thank you. <laughs> it's It's been a while. We're working on a project right now, a podcast series. It's going to be uh, Boone, a biography by Robert Morgan. And if you're listening to this podcast right now, then I am most likely out hunting because it's either September, October, or early November. And that's the time for me to not be in the office, but to be in the mountains for 60 days plus... Um, Chasing game. How many more years you got left? I ride? don't know. How many more I'm, years? I'm pushing. Uh, I'm for, 48, just about. I'll be 48 by the time this podcast drops. Okay. Yeah. And um, Lampers is 49, but I feel great. I feel like I'm as fit as I've ever been, and more skilled and capable than I've ever mm-hmm. been. So that's all good. I hope you guys are enjoying these book readings that we're doing. Brent, uh, Brent needed to uh i needed brent to come along and add a little flavor we really enjoyed reading the river of doubt this is going to be in the same vein i think you guys i'm excited enjoy this. because like i know who daniel boone is yep i've heard things this is virgin for brent but yeah like not a lot into it. it's kind of like that band you always hear about yeah. that you never listen to right which uh, i'm afraid is the story for your generation and younger pretty oh, really? much uh i don't think that our education system has done much to to uh, prepare or educate our youth on the history of how we got to where we are today as a nation, and it's a travesty. It's you get the cliff notes. You get the no, you don't. You get the sixteen nineteen lie project lie. I I, I you get, you get I got, the I got, I got I got some of the stuff. You know, I definitely got the Lewis and Clark, and I got like the Daniel Boone <laughs> and stuff. I got like the cliff notes. I got the Sacagawea nonsense. I suppose. Did like, you I get, got the cliff note? Did version. you get the? Uh, Americans down are, Disney are version. white people are evil, and I didn't all, get that part. all the native people were just victims. Sort of uh, that was kind of a vibe down that version. was starting to come when I was in school. It wasn't really there before. Yeah, like it, like it at the tail end. There was a little bit of a. Now the white people gave everybody white pox blankets <laughs> and killed everybody. <laughs> like, white let's pox. Not forget that smallpox. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So uh, we're going to get right into this book, and I'm going to blow your mind, okay? Um, Before we do, I want to remind everybody, if you like the show, like what we do, like and subscribe to the channel. And as always, check out our partners over at Mountain Ops for some Yeti mode, some Yeti, Ignite, Blaze Shots. What else, Brent? Renew for happy poops. Mm -hmm. A few things like that. Stealthy Nutrition, glassing pads, rifle covers, uh, Detox Plus, uh, Digest Plus. They've got uh, Immune Probiotics, which all those products I love. Plus all the CBD products that Stealthy has for us old people with that want to maintain good uh, low levels of inflammation and lubricated joints and such. Um, and I really love the CBD sleep gummies, especially on a hunt after a hard day's hike. Sometimes I'm so restless and sore from all that exertion. It's nice to take a little chewy gummy and I'm knock out. I'm always nervous about taking anything that's supposed to knock me out. It's not melatonin based. And so I don't know what sort of magic base, elixir Hillary is. came up with, Doctor Hillary, Hillary Hoodoo, is Lampers, what it is. but it just is the right amount. One of those little, one of those little gems. I t- I chew up one of those little yummy gummies and I go right to sleep. Helps me sleep deep and long. Um, the other thing I've been doing is I've been taping my mouth shut at night. Really? Okay. For about why. two months. I had Mike Mutzel on the podcast from in June when I was at the Western Hunting Summit, Ryan's and Hillary's Metabolic Western Mike. Hunting Summit. Yes. And Mike gave me this little tidbit to tape my mouth shut when I go to sleep. And when I tape my mouth shut, it would make me, help me breathe through my nose all night. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, scientific studies, kind of uh, peer-reviewed empirical studies that prove that sleeping with your mouth closed and breathing through your nose has tremendous sleep benefits, uh, stops the snoring, helps you, uh, your tongue and your throat and everything kind of relax when your mouth is open and falls mm-hmm. into the airway and blocks the airway. Uh, the nose has lots of, uh, there's a reason when we have the nose and it, mm-hmm. it has a lot of value in terms of um, uh, filtering air as it comes in. Mm-hmm. You're way less likely to get sick, to be sick. 
uh, you're less likely, you, you, you seem to uh, in, uh, absorb oxygen better and expel carbon dioxide more effectively, things like that. It's pretty wild that even Dr. Andrew Huberman even went so far as to show studies where you're, you become uglier if you're a mouth breather. Like there's a, <laughs> I'm not kidding. There's no, th- yeah, there's no. actually studies where they have shown that it disfigures or changes your physical appearance, including your mouth and how you, how you look physically. So I could, I could find if I, I you could, could become better looking if you just stop breathing through your mouth at night. We went down different, different <laughs> ideas. So I can find somebody <laughs> and recognize this mouth breather look. <laughs> And call them an ugly Look, effing mouth breather. Yeah, all I'm telling you is what I've what these doctors have have shown, and uh, I'll talk about. I'll dive into it a little bit as I do some research later in the year, and and I'll bring up some of these things. But yeah, uh, I have been taping my mouth at night, and it's actually been uh, amazing. I've sl- been sleeping so much, so well, um, combined with a little bit of hmm. CBD sleep gummy from from Stealthy. Boom. So. Give it a try, brother. You know, I uh, I got a sleep app machine about a year and a half yeah. ago or something like that. And when I went in there... The they la- tape your mouth shut, don't they? So that's the thing. So the, the, the lady that I went in there was this gorgeous black lady, curly ring ro- mm-hmm. ringlet hair. And I was like, I was flirting up a storm with her. <laughs> and then she was like, yeah, I have a husband, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> but... um. She was like, so uh, we need to like get you like a jaw strap or blah, 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 or like some tape to do that with and stuff. And I was like, I don't really do that. Like my mouth never really comes open when I'm sleeping. She's like, if, if you're snoring, then your mouth is open. Yeah. And right. I was like, my mouth isn't open. Like I have videos from, from Daisy mm-hmm. and stuff, you know, and like I, I never open my mouth. I would just like suffocate. Yeah. My, my throat collapses in the back. My mouth never mm-hmm. opens. Mm-hmm. So I've never actually taped. Yeah, I slept with a sleep app machine, which is annoying. Yeah, yeah. Well, sleep is so important, and there are many people who struggle with a good night's rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of it is due to apnea and the the the, the loss of oxygen throughout the mm-hmm. night, and so you continually can't get into that deep sleep because you're constantly um, not getting enough oxygen and waking up, and then it's a fitful mm-hmm. night, and you're continually and it just builds on itself. The la- the yep. more you more you your sleep isn't good, the worse and worse it gets, and mm-hmm. it compounds, and other things start to happen. But anyway, yeah, check out Stealthy Nutrition Mountain Ops, great partners of ours, and uh, we appreciate that. So let's get into the book here. I'm going to start yeah. with the introduction. Just At get first. right into it. It says, "Forget the coon ki- uh, the coon skin cap." Brent. Forget the 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 coon skin. Why is that word so? I know <laughs> skin, the skin, coon skin dang it. cap. You got me. I have. I can say coon skin. No problem. Yeah. Just now. Forget the coon skin cap. He never wore one. Daniel Boone thought coon skin caps uncouth, heavy, and uncomfortable. Uncouth. I love that word. He always wore a beaver felt hat to protect him from sun and rain. I love beaver felt hats. By the way, I've never come across one. In real life, Anthony and I had a couple we used on a deer hunt a while back, and I, I remember could that. Not believe how comfortable and warm. And if I didn't think I'd get shot with one on my head from some hunter in a rifle hunt, I'd wear it all the time. I think <laughs> I need one. I do think they're they're uh, phenomenal, especially in those super cold hunts. Mm-hmm. You know what I've learned? Pretty much anyone that gets des- described as uncouth, mm-hmm. I I just seem to jive with. <laughs> we get along, you know. The coon skin topped boon is the image from Hollywood and television. In fact, much that the public thinks it knows about Boone is fiction. He was neither the discoverer of Kentucky nor the first settler in the blue bluegrass region. He did not discover the Cumberland Gap, known to the Indians as Quasiota, nor was he the first white man to dig ginseng in the North American wilderness. And though he held the rank of lieutenant colonel in the militia more than once, he was for the most part a reluctant soldier and Indian fighter. As one of his first biographers said, he never delighted in shedding human blood, even that of his enemies in war, and avoided it whenever he could. The real story of Daniel Boone is more complicated than, than the fiction, stranger and far more interesting. He was Emerson, it was Emerson who said, all history resolves itself very easily into a biogra- biography of a few stout and earnest persons. That's pretty interesting. Certainly Boone was one of those stout and earnest individuals. 
Even in his own time, Boone had a number of detractors, debunkers, and critics. He was at first times accused of treason, fraud, and hypocrisy, and was once court-martialed, only to be exonerated and given a promotion by the Board of Presiding Officers. He was blamed for dishonest and incompetent land surveying and sued again and again for debt. Yet surviving records show he was a competent surveyor, though sometimes careless with clerical and legal work. By the end of his life, he had paid off all of his accusers, said he, all of that his accusers had he owed. He was also blamed for siding with Indians, accused of being a white Indian, yet the fortified and defended Boonesboro again, but he yet, but yet he fortified and defended Boonesboro against attack led by his adopted father, the Shawnee chief Blackfish. Boone was also accused of being a Tory, a British sympathizer, during the American Revolution. Yet he fought the British-led Indian attacks on Kentucky forts again and again. It's like if you're, it's like anybody who does awesome stuff is always going to have winners have haters, and Boone is like mm-hmm. the perfect example of a winner throughout his whole life. And people and dudes just being absolutely intolerably jealous of his success. Mm-hmm. You know what? This is funny. The, them calling him accusing him of being a white Indian. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the Ashweilers? Yeah, went to church with us growing up. Yeah. So uh, last, the dad, his aunts and uncles got kidnapped mm-hmm. by Indians when they were young, mm-hmm. and lived with Indians for like ten years. <laughs> yeah, crazy. And then they got they ended up being like quote saved or they were given the option of leaving yeah. and uh he he had like five or six of them and like one or two stayed yeah and like just like crazy stories of like that he was telling about them is like that's not that far dude that's his aunt and uncles no i mean if anything when you read about liver eating johnson which we just finished <laughs> that book brad and i read that together and you hear about how some of the eyewitness accounts of the people who were with Liver Eating Johnson, they died in, in you know, Liver Eating Johnson was around in like 1820. Mm-hmm. But but uh, one of the guys that he was with died in 1946. Dang. So, I mean, you have, I like, people stretch across time. Mm-hmm. When you look at our grandpa, who was over 90 years old, mm-hmm. what he witnessed and what he saw, like, he he saw the the evolution of technology to such vast degrees that that it blows your mind. They didn't have refrigeration back when he was born, mm-hmm. you know. Yet you and I, I, I have a mini fridge in my TV or in my car right now. <laughs> you know, so these things stretch through time. It's it's very interesting. That's why I love talking to old people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just have things they've seen and remember that uh, we take for granted or have lost sight of. Yeah, that whole conversation about Les and his aunt and uncle came up because he grew up eating liver constantly. Yeah. And we were having a conversation about liver, and he's like, yeah, my aunts and uncles, they grew up eating raw liver. And then he tells me this crazy story about them being kidnapped by Indians, just nonchalantly. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, Les. For me, the most striking and surprising result of a closer look at Boone is the way his sterling moral character shines steadily through all the vicissitudes of his remarkable life. Known as a scout and hunter, Boone became a patriarch, serving in legislatures and militias and on boards of trustees, a humble person who described himself as a common man. Boone was famous in both America and in Europe. At one time, he may have owned upward of 30,000 acres of land in Kentucky. He ran a tavern, a store, and a warehouse, and he traded furs, hides, ginseng, horses, even slaves, and land. He lost it all. Dang. A recognized leader all his life, he moved often he moved often as a gypsy. With little formal education and uncertain spelling, he read a number of books and had a flair for language, even eloquence. Like most great figures in American history, Boone has been both lucky and unlucky in his biographers. The schoolmaster and sometimes surveyor and land speculator John Filson made Boone famous when Boone fif- turned 50 in 1784. Filson's discovery, settlement, and present state of Kentucky included a long chapter called The Adventures of Colonel Daniel Boone. Written in the first person as though it was autobiography, 
The little book, destined to become a classic, was translated into French and German and pirated and paraphrased by a number of other authors. Reprinted by Gilbert Imlay in a topographical description of the Western Territory of North America, published in London in 1793. That's crazy, dude. The narrative made Boone famous in Britain and helped inspire such budding romantic poets as Wordsworth, Coolridge, and Robert Southey. It's funny to me how, like, I grew up on, like, Wild West movies and stuff, and, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I didn't think much about the Wild West, but as I got older, like, seeing how, like, other countries portrayed the Wild West is Mm -hmm. crazy. Have you seen Japan? Like, the pictures they have of, like, Wild West samurai? (laughs) Right. You know, with revolvers and and stuff, and, like, and they're, like, having these Western duels, but they're wearing, like, samurai attire, Mm -hmm. and with swords on, but still pulling out pistols. Only recently have we come to appreciate how much American romanticism may have influenced British romanticism. Hmm. But the impact of Boone's story and legend on William Bartram, Wordsworth, Byron, and other writers of the Romantic era is only the beginning of the story of the Boone legend and biography. When people do amazing things like Jeremiah Johnson, Mm -hmm. um, when Boone leads an amazing life that almost seems like impossible. Or couldn't have happened that way. Mm-hmm. Um, when you do amazing things, you have y- 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 human beings take notice, and it become you become a legend. You become part of of a a, a, a generation's um, icon. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? For better or worse, even. I feel like that um, could be said about Mike Tyson a lot. Yeah, you know he's oh. living as you know he's a legend right now, and he's living his legend. Few other Americans have had their lives told so often in such a wider range of styles, combining truth, insight, myth, hearsay, and outright fabrication. Because he became a figure of American folklore, even while alive, Boone has been thought by many to be virtually a fictional character, subject of tall tales like Mike Fink and the Keelboat Man, or even Paul Bunyan. A professor with a PhD in English and, and tenure at a major university once said to me, I never realized Daniel Boone was an actual person. Yeah, because I hear thought Daniel he was Boone a creation in... of folklore. Yep. I told her that even though she was wrong, she was also half right. Because the Boone mo- most people know about is largely the creation of fol- fol- folklore. It is hard to rescue figures like Daniel Boone and Johnny Appleseed from the distortions of television and Walt Disney. I'm glad they brought that up because that's what I thought of. Like when he said Daniel Boone, I was like, I wonder about Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> The folklore and legends are part of the story, too, but should be identified and separated from the facts. When viewed in the larger context of the colonial age, the Boone legend is, in many ways, typical of the the way stories and figures of quest and conquest were were romanticized. As Europeans conquered lands and peoples, yet many aspects of Boone's character are atypical, virtually unique. So one thing that's interesting is uh, I read this book probably five or six years ago seven years ago and I had no one to share it with, you know? (laughs) And, uh, but it really, I found it fascinating and there's a lot of things were, you know, became clearer to me. And, uh, I, so I asked Ryan Lampers to read it and Ryan doesn't read much. So, I mean, he does now, but I think at that time, you know, he did listen to a lot of audio type stuff and a lot of Mm -hmm. talk radio and stuff because he had a lot of traveling he would do. He listened to the book or, or read it. I don't recall, but we sat down and we, and we talked about it. And for Ryan, this Daniel Boone as a human being was so relatable that it felt like he was, Ryan felt like he was born in the wrong t- era. He found a kindred spirit. Like he should have been born this time, not now. He didn't fit in now. He uh-huh. would have fit in then. He wanted to be a homeless man in the woods. I mean, he can still do that, right? Like nothing, <laughs> nothing stopping him from living this life other than himself. He's doing a pretty good job living it now. To be re- to be fair, I think Tanya Boone would be like, "Bro, you got it right. <laughs> right, you did it. Ex- you got the fifty-fifty lifestyle." Except the except that Ryan and I aren't being hunted by Indians every time we go out. That you that, know, which of. completely I mean, changes. The overall, the, utter, the total feel There's from top to bottom. There's still lions and tigers and bears out there, okay? <laughs> yeah, being hunted by 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 a bear is a lot different than being hunted by other humans. Or a pack of wolves. 
<laughs> or a mountain lion. <laughs> Not the same, brother. So he says, um, um, while Boone more than once told visitors that Filson's account, who was his original biography, the first person who wrote about him, of his life was true, every word of truth. He was not so pleased with Daniel Bryan's would-be epic poem, The Mountain Muse, published in 1813, which portrayed him as a ridiculously heroic figure, a kind of American Moses. <laughs> Such productions ought to be left until the person was put in the ground, he is reported to have said. Of the rumor that he still went hunting at the age of 80, he observed to there Reverend go, John Mason you, Peck. You going to be hunting past 80? I am. <laughs> I am. I would not believe that tale if I told it myself. I have not watched the deer's uh, lick for 10 years. My eyesight is too far gone to hunt. So uh, he was still, so it's, you know, by 70, he was kind of done. Mm -hmm. But he also suffered from rheumatoid, severe rheumatoid arthritis about the time he hit 50. Which is ironic because other men did not. For mm -hmm. example, uh, Jeremiah Johnson did not suffer from arthritis. Mm. Jeremiah Johnson also seems to have uh, Neanderthal Viking blood um, <laughs> that uh, mm -hmm. made him somewhat of a freak human. So uh, we aren't all genetically equal. Uh, and, uh, but, but yeah, he did, he did kind of, uh, his body kind of uh, seemed to have trouble with bouts of rheumatoid arthritis in his 50s, 60s, 70s, mm. times where it was gone. And time where it would come back in, in severe levels and make it so he could hardly do anything. I bet he would appreciate it. Some trek and poles. Trek and poles and some CBD oil. Mm -hmm. Get your sissy sticks. <laughs> yeah. Peaks equipment. Use the code gritty. All right. So while Boone, um, during Boone's later years, many accounts of his exploits and adventures were published in newspapers in America and Britain. Most took their details and rhetoric from Filson and some contained an element of truth, but also included rumors and fancy, often portraying the old woods woodsman as a fierce Indian killer, wrestling bears and panthers in hand-to-hand -hand combat. More than once, he read accounts of his own death in newspapers. <laughs> so, he's... The, the whole introduction here continues on to basically say that, you know, that there's so much written about him. So much. Um that it's hard to di to separate the truth from the fiction. But in this book, he endeavors to do just that. In this biography, this uh, this uh, biography, he, he does that. Where he kind of just says, look, this is a known fact, more or less. This is written in, in you know, the records of the U.S. Army and the U.S. military. This is, mm -hmm. this is documented by lots of different people to the point where we pretty much know this is how it happened and so forth. And where it's not, he goes into detail saying, well, this is kind of speculative, but we do know this. What you're going to find out as we go through the book is you don't need to embellish anything. Like what he did in his life was remarkable. Um, and if you're, if you're an aspiring woodsman or outdoorsman hunt, hunter, you're going to find this pretty interesting because the solo hunting this man does is in the country he does it in for the years he does it in is absolutely bonkers. Like it's hard for me to fathom. And some people are just willing to do hard things. You know, I know a lot of people nowadays that won't drink a protein shake because it doesn't taste good. True. But I got to tell you. He's eating bark. He's eating bugs. I guarantee you he's eating stuff that like just, he's just harder than other people. Nah, I don't. You don't true. think that's it? If, if need be. But mostly what it is, I think people think Ryan and I are suffering and suffering. But we were, we've been working on this um, outdoor class uh, module because we're, we're, we're part of the outdoor class community mm -hmm. where we're building these online courses to help people backcountry hunt or to teach them how to bear hunt. So what's or, your course called? Like ours is backcountry hunting, a uh, backcountry hunting, but we, we talk about fitness, mental toughness, the gear we use and all that. But a big part of it is it does require mental toughness. It does require fitness, but also we're comfortable. I mean, we got fire and mm -hmm. teepees and stoves and our woodcraft and woodsman skills and our, our ability to, to pick spots to stay dry and warm, get out of storms, like stuff we take for granted. We had to really dive in and go, oh, yeah, we do this, don't we? We do that, don't we? Mm -hmm. To put it together, you realize like there's a, there's a skill in being 
comfortable and eating well mm-hmm. and thriving. We are thriving. I come back from these hunts. When I was 20 years ago, I'd come back from a hunt mm-hmm. with Cousin Ben and Anthony. And okay. I would have lost 20 pounds or more. Mm-hmm. I would have been eating garbage. I would have been swollen. I'd been sore for weeks. And I'd have knots in places I shouldn't. And, and I need time to recover. I mean, I was eating M and M's and and uh, Starbursts every day, you know. <laughs> Snickers, <laughs> it's Snickers, Milky Ways, Twixes, yeah. it, 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 just you know what you do when you were that age, and and we didn't know better. Mm-hmm. Now I come back from a hunt, you just I'm healthier than when I left. Yeah, abs are are po- popping out. I'm shredded, cut, lean. I hike ten miles a day. I eat super well. I sleep well. I work. I sleep within the circadian rhythms of nature. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the sun comes up. I wake up. Uh, sun goes down. I go to bed. These things are are you know. I I'm I, I'm I basically transition into a more primitive lifestyle mm-hmm. that I think the human body is more, including the diet uh, and hydration and all that. I, I move into that with all those things intact, and I come back from these month long in- trips, these two weeks here, two weeks there, healthier and stronger, and uh, in better condition than than when I left. Um, and part of it too is uh, the unplug, the unplugging of technology. Like I'm not mm-hmm. on TV, I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on social, which I don't do really anymore nowadays anyway. Um, but, but nonetheless, I, th- those things are really far removed mm-hmm. and, uh, I stopped thinking about email and business and da, da, da. I'm thinking about today, that elk, how I can get over there, how I can get in position, the stock, everything is subsumed by the goal and the activity. And I think that's a much more healthy way. You know, like we tend to chronically worry about the future and mm-hmm. all this, ch- all the emails and all the things we need to get back on all the packages we got to ship and all the whatever it is you do for a living and uh when you go out there and you do it for extended periods out of time you re- you realize like there's a whole bunch of life to be lived mm-hmm. and we fret too much when all yet when 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 each day when you wake up you got to figure out where the animals are try to kill one make sure you get water and food and shelter life becomes pretty basic and uh i think that's a good place to be mentally physically for the human body if you're doing it right but again it's not so much just a grind and sacrifice like we're cozy in a lot of ways in uh in healthy ways so the book goes on to say it's hard to to separate fact from fiction Mm -hmm. no doubt they are harder people because they live with in a harder time than we do um and uh it goes on to to talk about all the different books that were written about him um, and I, I'm not going to go through the rest of this introduction. I'm going to get right on to the rest of the book, but that gives you kind of a, a, a high level of idea of, uh, of sort of what we're dealing with right now with Daniel Boone. Okay. <clears throat> um, back to the book, um, Boone many times referred to himself as a woodsman. It was the description he seemed to prefer the identity he chose to claim. So um, it's interesting because he was hired by like, uh, I believe Jefferson Mm -hmm. uh, and others to do some exploration, maybe not Jefferson, Um, but, but uh, he was only a year different in age from George Washington. Wow. So you're talking Revolutionary War. You're talking when the British were were very much involved in um, in the Americas at the time. We had the French and the Spanish we were contending with, plus the the Indians. Um, you know, I think Last of the Mohicans is kind of a, uh, a you know that that's the time frame you're kind of dealing with, and the location more or less is uh, sort of that period. That's Daniel Boone's period. Um, for, for a period, if you've seen the movie, um, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett never met each other. Yeah. So says the internet. (laughs) All right. So, um, okay. I'm going to get back in here. He, he never becomes like a statesman. He never becomes much of anything except a woodsman. 
And uh, I think that's why Ryan Lampers related to him. Because at all, at the end of the day, all he wanted to do ever was just be in the woods. And anything else was just sort of something he needed to do before he could go back to the woods again. Um, And uh, where other men would go out and do some exploration, they would then come back and retire as a mayor or leader of the city or or as a judge or a lawyer or something. Mm -hmm. Boone never really transitioned from being a scout and a woodsman. That's just where his heart was. Um, All right. Let's get into this. The Mother World of the Forest, 1734 to 1750. Can you can you just picture Brent that time frame? 1734. No. I mean, gosh, that was a while ago. No. Like uh 1800s kind of a little bit, 17, it just kind of gets a little gray. 17 is back there. Mm-hmm. Back there. But uh like I said, if you've seen Last of the Mohicans, um which was a, a novel, a fictional novel written by James Fenimore Cooper, which I've read a couple of times. It's really flowery language. It's an interesting really? read. Um, but the book is uh, was super famous at the time um, and still is considered a, a classic, mm-hmm. although some ridicule it as tripe. But the, 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 the time frame, it's set within historical factual time frames but it's the adventures of these people mm-hmm. uh um, fictional people p- fictional people that that were there right so some of the characters are absolutely authentic like and events it's surrounding actual events where mm-hmm. forts gets get attacked by the french and their surrenders by the british and you know all that kind of stuff that that was real but the characters in the book are all fictional the Quakers of Devonshire lived as farmers and weavers in hamlets and mountain valleys. They had broken away from the official church and had been uh, punished by fines and ostracism, sometimes by prison and whippings. As Quakers, they could not hold office or vote. As pacifists, it was against their faith to serve in the army or the navy. They could not attend school or train for the learned professions. As followers of George Fox, they called themselves friends. And they did not have a hierarchy of clergy or ritualized service. They met in silence and spoke only as the spirit stirred them. The ties of neighbors and among the friends were very close. Though often persecuted and exploited, they attempted to live lives of calm goodwill and honest work, farming and weaving linen and wool, blacksmithing and helping one another. The Boons were Quakers from Devonshire in the extreme southwest of England. Devonshire is one of the most beautiful counties of Great Britain, a place of highlands and moors covered with heather and bracken, high rocky hills, long pleasant valleys running down to the sea. The river X rises out of the bog in the north and runs through Brampton, Tiverton, Stoke, Cannon, Exeter. The Boone family had been settled in this area for at least 200 years, living primarily around Exeter, an ancient town with buildings dating from Roman, Saxon, Norman, and Tudor times. Exeter's splendid cathedral dated from the 11th century and had been rebuilt between 1280 and 1370 as a Gothic masterpiece. When you learn about the Roman Empire and how the Roman Empire, you know, you're talking gladiator, you know, Mm -hmm. think back to that hate to use all these movie references, but look, that's the world we live in today. And you picture the, 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 uh, the stadium, the, the, the gladiators fighting the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was spreading and taking over the continent, mm-hmm. you know, much like how the Mongols did at one point. And um, the Roman Empire was, um, in some ways, they allowed each culture and each people to kind of maintain their own rules and laws, but oh, they were yeah. still under the Roman Empire. I'd rather be conquered by the Romans than I think the Mongols. Yeah, they kind of had this sense of uh, individual freedoms and rights as uh-huh. a citizen, which um, the you Mongols had the Greeks. Were into, like piles of skulls. You had the Greeks as well, um, who had their thing going on, mm-hmm. um, and you had the Roman Empire and the Greek kind of um, both uh, interacting at the time. And the Romans go so far west. In the west, to, into Germany, and then 
as far all the way, the Romans go as all the way to England, which is a long way from the Roman Empire in Italy. Mm-hmm. And when they get to England, they actually have trouble fighting the blue painted people. Um, the, Hicks. the, uh, the, they, they, they have to fight like the psychos. I mean, kind of picture, uh, Jeremiah Johnson. That's a savage man. Uh, <laughs> you, you, when I think of the Scots and the Irish and mm-hmm. the British and stuff, and, um, I mean, these people, they were pagans, like, mm-hmm. and a lot of, uh, up, up, up closer to the Scottish and all that. There's a lot of Viking heritage going on there as well. But anyway, you end up with um, these old ramparts and and old uh, buildings, structures that were that were created by the Romans that were that were totally foreign to the primitive, more primitive people who were there, mm-hmm. and the Romans never quite um, get a foothold fully in England before they just quit and leave or the empire falls. But they started, they made their way there and there, there was, so for like a, hundreds and hundreds of years after the Romans left, you had all these British folks sitting there looking at these, <laughs> these aqueducts and these mm-hmm. different buildings and stuff going, how the hell did these damn Romans make this thing? Mm-hmm. Cause they were still like living in stone huts and, and, uh, and, and very primitive. And it shows the clash of technology It never quite becomes much but it's interesting to look go back in history and see how how uh in england today even now there's still um leftovers of the roman of roman mm-hmm. occupation and the time that they were there even though it was quite short-lived what is it is it uh is it hadrian's wall or is it adrian's wall i don't remember you know what I'm talking about the wall it goes like all along the side yeah, yeah 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 it's not a very big wall i've seen pictures of it with my ex-wife standing next to it mm-hmm. She's not very big. <laughs> She's taller than the wall. Yeah, well, I think those walls yeah. have come down. I think at the time they were really high, but they've slowly just come down until just the base of yeah, the wall. I don't left. know if that's the case or they were just like. I read some books about Ireland and I was mm-hmm. reading some accounts of um, old forts and things that the, that the, that the English had built there that were mm-hmm. still there. Um, but anyway, um, so back to this Exeter, had long been a center for the weaving and dyeing trades, producing a woolen cloth of serge weave. But it was also a market center where many goods as well as produce were sold near the cathedral. Smiths made guns, horseshoes, hinges, and tools for the village. George Boone II completed an apprenticeship as a blacksmith and married Sarah Uppy around 1660. Upai? Uppy? Not sure. And then uh, it says he, before settling down to his trade at Stoke Cannon. George II was a member of the Church of England, prosperous, entitled to a pew at the parish church, and he was the father of George III, born in 1666, who became a Quaker. Okay? So, um, the man who founded the Society of Friends, George Fox, you know, George Fox University in Oregon, Mm -hmm. named after him, was born in Nottinghamshire in 1624 to a Puritan family and was apprenticed to a shoemaker. At the age of 18, he experienced a conversion, a call, and began to wander from town to town, valley to valley, witnessing and exhorting, encouraging drunkards and sinners to repent and reform. He supported himself by making shoes. In Nottingham, Fox was jailed for intruding on a church service, shouting, Truth is not in this meeting. He was arrested in Der- Derbyshire for preaching in the street. His message of humility and simplicity began to attract followers and enemies, and in places he and his listeners were stoned. His flocks were primarily artisans and farmers. His followers were especially well-received in the West County in Devon and Cornwall. So the Church of England was corrupt, um, political, things like that. And, and uh, you have these communities being that are sort of distancing themselves from where the power base is Mm -hmm. the corrupt part of the church and branching off and creating like a branch of Quakers. And we kind of know how that story goes. The Puritans, they come across, they, they flee England and come to America. Right. And, uh, that was so they could have religious freedom. 
um, because they believed in uh, a faith and believed in a worship that wasn't to be prosecuted, persecuted. And they were being persecuted, no question, um, because when when you have a power structure, an authoritarian power structure, nonetheless, or one power structure in general, they they want to maintain that power base. Mm-hmm. And when you have some other people developing and creating their alternative economy and people and community, um, they're a threat to your power. And uh, some of this was, I'm sure, done in the name of religion, but generally a lot of, I think, the Church of England's moves were done in the name of power, just like uh, the Roman Catholic Church in uh, England. Much of uh, what they were, they will, it, the church became political gotcha. instead of spiritual. So um, before a Quaker could move away, he had to get a certificate of cleanness from his meeting, declaring his faith and good character. Quakers were expected to visit the sick and bereaved, talk with the troubled, and discuss problems and plans in the family and the community. To marry, they had to obtain approval of the Committee of Friends and were forbidden to keep company or marry outside the community of Quakers. They had to avoid all gambling, music, frivolity, but because Quakers were known to be trustworthy in their dealings, they gained the respect of society and their business prospered. You kind of see this, though. Wherever people become more faithful, lean on God in general, in a more in a more clean and pure way, you end up with very prosperous communities. Mm-hmm. Um, people hate the Jews forever because the Jews are prosperous. Mm-hmm. Um, people hate the Mormons. Uh, you and I are, are fully aware of that. You know, Mormons are wealthy in general. A lot, many are. Many have mm-hmm. been. When you live a lifestyle that is, to a degree, um, responsible and moral. You tend to, especially in a community that promotes hard work, honesty, you know, um, service, you Mm -hmm. you tend to, instead of gamble your money away or spend it on hedonism, you tend to spend your money on, on property and land and investing for the future. And you feel like you have a duty to live in a moral fashion. And therefore you, you know, people don't always, of course... The, the criticism to that is these people are fake. They're not really that nice. They're not really that good. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Within every community, you you have you have weak and corrupt people. But in general, uh, I would argue that most of these communities uh, are well-meaning and try to do, live their best life in accordance to what the gospel of Christ was they felt was teaching them to do and be, you know? Mm -hmm. So you have these Quakers, um, and that's the history. That's where he comes from. Right. So George the third and Mary, uh, Modridge Boone joined the friends meeting, uh, in uh, 1702. Um, basically, um, it ends up that they decide it's, let's see that they decide, um, they think of immigrating to the new world. Mm-hmm. Okay. George the fourth, Sarah and Squire Boone traveled to Pennsylvania in early 1713 and George four and Squire Boone joined the friends meeting there, the congregation. It would seem the younger Boones were sent to Pennsylvania to scout out opportunities for George the third. Okay. So the, the, the younger ones, uh, Sarah and Squire, um, they're sent to America, the new world to scout mm-hmm. out what Pennsylvania is like and should we all move there? And, uh, once they went there, the whole family moved there eventually. But before he left Devonshire for America, George Boone, the third wrote out a confession to the local society of friends. The handwritten copy still exists in the Devon hall of records in Exeter. In the letter, he admits a number of failings. I am constrained to make mention of this, my transgression, not without grief, but with trouble and sorrow of heart for this, my wickedness, which was keeping of wild company and drinking by which I sometimes became guilty of drunkenness to the dishonor of truth. And then he goes on to confess another shortcoming. I fell into another gross evil, which I also confessed to my great shame and sorrow that I did so little regard the Lord and the dear mercies of the Lord, but went on in another gross sin by which the honor due unto marriage was lost for the marriage bed was defiled. Hmm. With whom? Yeah, it doesn't really say. Doesn't so say. 
he can conf- he he does this confession. He's like some things I'm ashamed of. Which back then, um, uh, I believe the Quakers practiced this public confession where they would confess what they'd done wrong to the public and then they would work then the public together would work on moving mm-hmm. forward you know um and uh it it's it's kind of interesting i think i think confession has been around since the beginning of time you know mm-hmm. and there's there is a ease of there's a guilt that comes when you do things when when you don't live up to the integrity that you have Mm-hmm. it's not so much what other people think of you. It's that you feel like you should have been a better person or you mm-hmm. should have acted in a, in a better way than you did. You weren't integrity is living up to your own value system. That's all it means is that y- you try to live up to what you think is, is uh, your stay true to yourself basically, but we're all human. So we're all going to fail. And so when, when someone does try to live up to their, to them, to, to their standard that they set for themselves. It's it in fitness in health in in um, work ethic in, in uh, morality, all of us have goals and standards that we strive for. But the reason that they're standards we strive for is because we're not there yet. And so it's the fake it till you make it. It's the work at it until you get there kind of thing. And then once we, as people achieve a certain standard, we set a higher standard for ourselves Mm -hmm. you can see it in terms of just diet and exercise you get here and you're like i could do better i could i could get a little better here and here and there's this growth and continual improvement in yourself as a human as a person and you grow this is this is that kind of culture you know Mm -hmm. um and um so he wrote this confessional letter confessing about this, but never named any names. And then nobody else came forward or wrote another letter or something like that. So they don't know who it is. I don't know. Um, I don't know um, how that happens. What's interesting, though, is you're going to find this out, Brent. Um, once you get to the new world and you're living on the frontier, they don't take this stuff too seriously. They're like, dude, we're just trying to live out here. I might die tomorrow. God's got my back, but I'm not going to like be overly. These are sort of sometimes, I think sometimes, these are the luxuries of wealth in modern society. When you got Indians hunting you down in the, in the, in, in the wild and, 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 you know, and you're just trying to survive and you haven't, you're out in the wilds and your husband has been gone for a year and a half. And you don't know if he's dead or alive. Mm-hmm. You might, you might welcome someone into your home that, uh, even though you're married, that you might not otherwise, mm-hmm. and vice versa. You might take an Indian uh, squaw uh, because you've been away for a year and a half and you're lonely, like mm-hmm. these. Th- and then they don't beat themselves too much up too much about this stuff, no, um, because their their existence is so hard won on the daily mm-hmm. that they're just like, I don't blame you, man. I've been gone for 18 months or yeah. 24 months. I would have thought I was dead too. No big deal. Whose kid is it? <laughs> it's your brother's. Oh, oh, well. oh, at least it's in the family oh, and thanks. you roll on. You'll, <laughs> you you roll on Brian. Do you do you? Back to, they do then. But I think there's some pausing. I think there's some pausing. <laughs> You know, at least some collecting of your thoughts uh, and, you know, your I don't demeanor. know. This is what's fascinating about this. Um, and we're, we'll get into it a little bit more. So I think um, the mentality, though, is like, I don't think those people have any other choice but to take life on life's terms. You know, I well, feel like everybody that's, does. Right. No matter what time you're from. Well, I, I definitely agree with that. But I feel like today we have a lot of options or like there's certain things we don't have to worry about so much anymore. In today's society, like food. Yeah. I don't have to worry about food and stuff like this. And so, like, my problems are very different. But. Yeah. Here's what's interesting. Many of the people who came to the United States, uh, the Americas at this time, the new world, they came for religious reasons. Some were probably financial, Mm -hmm. but the great majority was for, uh, they felt inspired or they had religious uh, yearnings to do Mm -hmm. it. It says many Quakers had already gone to the new world in the 1600s because we're dealing with 1716, 1702, you know. So in the 1600s, William Penn, the son of an admiral, highly uh, respected by King Charles II, had been inspired by the inner light 
as a youth and was expelled from Oxford University for refusing to attend Anglican services. Uh, Anglican services. He became associated with George Fox and preached on the continent. He served as trustee for Quakers immigrating to the New World. By 1678, there were hundreds of Quakers from Yorkshire living in New Jersey. Some had already crossed the Delaware into what would become Pennsylvania, where Swedish immigrants had earlier built settlements. The headquarters of the Quakers in America was established at Burlington, New Jersey in 1677, and George Fox visited the community there to encourage the members. So, um, um, anyway, they, you, you, this is it. You have these people moving to, to the uh, United States, to the Americas at the time and, uh, not, not called the U S yet. And you have immigrants from all over and they talk about it in the book from, um, Switzerland, Holland, Germany, uh, Ireland, London, Welsh, uh, all moving to the United States during that, uh, during that period, 50 ships arrived in Philadelphia in 16, between 1682 and 1684 in a two year period. It's a lot of people. See a lot of people coming to the, to the Americas at this time. So Edward Morgan Bala, a Welsh Quaker who had arrived in 1691 settled with his family. So this is about 25 years before, um, the Boones show up. And uh, nine years later, they moved to, um, I can't say that, a township near Gwynedd. Here, Squire Boone, who would become the father of Daniel Boone, met Edward's daughter, Sarah. A friend's meeting house had been established in Gwynedd in 1701, and George III and Mary Boone had moved there soon after they arrived in America. So George and Mary are, are Daniel Boone's uh, I believe grandparents and then his father is Squire Boone and, and Sarah, Sarah Boone. The Morgans of uh, Marion Shire in North Wales had become Quakers soon after George Fox visited in 1657. Okay. So um, let's get on ahead here. It says uh, Quakerism had taken root in the part of, in that, that part of Wales following the preaching of Morgan Lloyd. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, this is a lot about sort of the, the, the church and how it was a stuff. Quaker communities were established at this time. Mm-hmm. All this was, um, all this was just to, to, to lay the groundwork, the understanding of where Boone comes from. What are his roots? Mm-hmm. Right. What are the roots of the entire? Yeah, I did not know he was a Quaker community. I mean, a lot of the people who came were fairly well to do, mm-hmm. but were also fairly well wealthy at this time. The early early settlers of the United of the Americas. When George the Third and Mary Boone arrived in Pennsylvania in 1717 with their six younger children, Mary, John, Joseph, Benjamin, James, Samuel, they first lived with their son George the Ford and his wife. Deborah Howell Boone in uh, Abingdon. Um, Okay. It was at Gwynedd near Oli that Squire Boone and Sarah Morgan were given permission to marry on the 30th day of the sixth month in 1720. So those are Daniel Boone's parents, Squire Boone and Sarah Morgan. Quakers referred to the months by numbers to avoid using the pagan names such as January and February. (laughs) Pagan names? Uh huh. That's funny. Earlier that same year, George the Third had been required to confess to the Gwynedd monthly meetings his forwardship in giving his consent to the marriage of his daughter Mary to someone contrary to the established order among us. Interesting. Hmm. This was not the last time a Boone would be asked to confess and apologize to the friends for the behavior of his children. So. Apparently, she wasn't full-on Quaker the way that Squire Boone was Quaker, and he married her anyway. So then the dad had to, like, apologize to the community for what his son did. I'm sorry. He broke the rules. That's, That's all I got, you know. Squire Boone has been described as a rather small man with fair skin, red hair, and gray eyes. Sarah Morgan was taller than most women. 
with black eyes and black hair, strong and active. The marriage of Squire and Sarah is described in the Gwynedd Friends Meeting Book. At a solemn assembly of the said people, the Quakers, the said Squire Boone took the said Sarah Morgan by the hand and did in a solemn manner declare that he took her to be his wife, promising to be unto her a faithful and loving husband until death should separate them. And then there in the said assembly, Sarah Morgan did likewise declare. What's really interesting is you're talking about England being an educated place, civilized, laws, rules, common law, um, sort of um, a very advanced, educated civilization. Mm -hmm. Coming to America, you have people who were born in England, raised in that way, bringing their traditions and their, their knowledge and values here. Then you see the first generation of those born here that never experienced England, but are still taught by parents mm -hmm. who did experience England. And then you have the next generation who were taught by the parents who did see, but they, their parents didn't know England. Mm -hmm. And you start to see this uneducation happen over time mm -hmm. as people then only know what they grew up with there. And due to the need to just survive, uh, thwart Indian attacks, you know, plant crops and just get by. Due to that, you end up with a whole a whole slew of um, individuals who don't have time to deal with Oxford University and, and studies when they need to learn how to recognize an Indian call in the woods and track and find game and learn how to dig for ginseng. Um, you know, harvest salt and 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 mm -hmm. and plant crops, right? And so you can see how the environment shapes the people over time. Um, the wealth of the nation and the luxuries of civilization are gone, and how what people really, uh, how people really survive. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I think that's good for today. We we've and every time we dive into a new book, we always we always end up this way where. There's a lot of talking just mm -hmm. to establish context and background before we get into the cool stuff. So it's coming. I hope you enjoyed the episode so far. What we talked about we got seven pages in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's more than that, and more like thirty. But um, it's going to get interesting. Tune in next next episode for the continuation of this. I hope you guys are having a great fall, hunting and slaying. Um, if uh, if you like what we do, check out Go Hunt maps use the code gritty for their explorer membership it's only 30 bucks brent because when you spend 50 on the maps you get a 20 dollars store credit for the go hunt gear shop and when you use the code gritty at the gear shop you get i think 10 percent off hmm. at the gear shop sometimes the discounts are bigger so use the code gritty at go hunt if you need some gear use it for their insider membership or for their uh, map explorer membership and uh all the code works everywhere and uh, I can't recommend the map system enough. The uh, satellite imagery is is uh, among the best out there. It's a must-have, in my opinion. And uh, so is the fact that you can download 10 times bigger maps Dang. than you can with anything else at high resolution. With all 50 states, you can, you can get all 50 states for that $30 value. And, uh, yeah, it's a must-have. Get it. Uh, everyone should have multiple map systems on your phone for... Um, back up and to compare and contrast between the two and and uh it's just a smart move as Livese has always said and uh if you haven't checked out the e-scouting courses by mark Livese, do that at treeline academy use the code gritty over there as well thanks for tuning in see you next time stay gritty <laughs>